are going to be recording just like that. Um, if you uh, would benefit from captions, we have them by rev.com. Um, you can click that on the bottom of the screen. And hopefully you are here for the session entitled Integrating Coaching into Supervision. And while it's into supervision, I would argue that when I learned about coaching, I use it in many of my relationships in my life. Um, they're just really powerful skills to have. Uh, and we're going to talk about why. So I'm really thrilled in whatever capacity that you're here, that you are. Um, thank you for investing the time in yourself and hopefully in future interactions and relationships to learn a little bit about coaching um, through the Shape the Trainer workshop series. Oh, it's just so fun to see folks that I haven't um, seen for a little bit or who joined us yesterday. Caitlin, it's great to see you. Cami, hi again. Okay. All right. Now I'm going to share my screen. Here we go. Share the sound. Here we are. Boom. Ooh, God, I love that chat. Lighten up. Hump day. Okay. Um, I want that. I want participants. And we're here. Okay. So integrating coaching into supervision. That's why we're here. That's what we're going to talk about. And to start off, um, I want to make sure that everyone's familiar with Zoom. We talked a little bit about captions. Give me those reactions. Love those thumbs up. I love the hearts. I like it in the chat. I will try to follow along. Rachel is here with me holding it down um, if I miss anything, which inevitably I do, and give some grace. Love that heart fan. Thanks. And really another reminder that um, the intention with all of these workshops, as it is with our work at CSU, to hold the principles and community centered. Um, to ensure that integrity, inclusion, respect, service, and social justice are not just five phrases that roll off the tongue as lovely as they do for me, but that they truly are um, backed by behavior. And um, so that's something that I really thought about in terms of where I was getting my materials for this, because I will acknowledge that coaching as an industry and coaching is an industry. People hire executive coaches, life coaches, birth coaches, all of that. It's, it's pretty centered and white. And coaching exists all over in the countries across the world. And so I know that beyond white people are coaching, we're gonna see some of them in some videos that we're gonna watch. And knowing myself and my identities, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize, and if there is feedback for me, call me in. And, and welcome us into the continued conversations around it because I want to provide skills that are um, interculturally astute and um, aware of the differences in ability, in identities, in backgrounds, et cetera. So that's an invitation um, to have conversations and continue making all of us better as a community. So today what we're gonna do, if I've done my job right, this hour will fly by. Um, as it probably will. <laughs> um, we're going to take some time to define coaching. Like, oh, are we talking about soccer? Are we talking about cheerleading? Are we talking about the flute? What are we talking about here? Um, we're going to discuss when and how to use it in supervision. And then focus on two primary skills for coaching because I want to leave you with like, ooh, those are the two things, right? It is not all encompassing. I have taken 60 hours of training, um, but in one hour, I want to uplift two specifically um, and then really provide you with some tools to take with you because that is uh, what's so, <laughs> yes, what's so important in this. Okay. Um, first of all, I want, it's going to be a mess, but I want everyone to find your mute button, come off mute right now and just say hi, hello, in whatever language you like. I want to hear a cacophony of, of voices right now. Hi, hello. Hello. What's even better is I like recognize the familiarity of some of those voices. It was so great. Okay. So now that we've done that once, maybe it won't be as scary if I ask you to do it again, um, because I do want some insight and input into where we're going to go today. All right. Before we start, you're like, why are you talking about this? And here's why this past year, um, my professional development journey to be better for all of you at the Lori Student Center at Colorado State was I wanted coaching to be part of the training and talent development that I was able to offer. So I have my, I show you Rachel, I have my, from the, uh, from the coaching federation that I worked with, 
And um, I'm going to give you just a little snippet, but I learned about it. I read these books and I was like, oh my gosh, I have got to share this. And so even before I was done with that, I knew that I wanted to do a training about incorporating some of these. My, my goal was that, you know, I realized that I got... I got pretty big for my britches. I've been teaching for 13 years. I've been supervising. I like to think that I lead in some capacities. And I realized that I was making a lot of statements. I was kind of like putting my thoughts and opinions out there, whether or not they were backed up. And coaching really got me to ask some powerful questions of myself and of other people that I was involved with and interacting with. I still make a lot of statements. It is something that I'm, I'm working with. <laughs> I'm, I'm working to uh, address and assess with myself, but I am getting better. Um, there are hopefully are some folks on this call that can attest to that, right? And I know that um, really listening and having the opportunity to engage in those questions, it has more of a lasting impact and it creates buy-in for people. Statements, they're this short term, right? This like, this pop in and like sometimes like woof, Dr. Kyle Oldham yesterday, I was typing out his one liners. I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> and they might fleet away when I'm able to interact with someone one on one and ask powerful questions and able to listen to the answers and invite them to listen to the answers. It moves us in a long term different direction um, that hopefully will be on a similar page or the page they need to go, which I argue is what supervision is all about. So um, this was my class, this was my cohort. I did it online. Um, I did two different levels. They were 30 hours each. It was a great experience and they were from industries and all over the country and world. Actually, we had um, folks from three different countries as well. So it was a pretty, pretty um, awesome experience. So now you all have come off muting, <laughs> muting. <laughs> You've come off mute before. So I wanna hear at least two voices and then a few folks in the chat also what do you think coaching is? What are, what, you know, either based on the story that I just told or your experiences before, what is coaching? Nancy, I saw you come off. <laughs> Guilty. No. Uh, for me, coaching in supervision is inspiring others to follow. Oh, so. Inspiring others to follow. Yes. Not Thank pushing, you. not demanding, but inspiring. Awesome. You're getting some love from other people on there too. Um, I'm seeing guidance, fine tuning the basics, helping people build their existing talents, guidance and support to allow others to find their path and bringing out the potential and people to work together towards accomplishing a goal. I'm seeing goal twice, enhancing people's strengths. These are great. Keep them coming. There was so much awesomeness in the chat. We're only going to have Nancy's voice in it. You all are very much starting on that journey bringing out the best in people, enhancing their strengths, setting people up for their next great step, setting people up for their next great step. Amy, that's clutch. Because when we're looking at coaching as an industry, it's not coaching and supervision. Coaching and supervision is looking at that next step in the position, or maybe that next step outside of that position, right? that there are realities that sometimes there's a time frame on a job. Sometimes there's a limit for responsibilities that you can have in a job. What and how within the context of education also can we set people up for their next step in the position, making taking on more responsibilities or expanding a project. Um, all of that is, is awesome. Nancy, I saw that. Absolutely not, you are not done. We, we've got 49 more. Keep on, keep your, keep your engagement up. So yes, coaching in essence is this. As we're talking about getting people to achieve their goals, our goals collectively, working together, et cetera, the essence of coaching is asking powerful questions to deepen learning for forward movement. asking powerful questions to deepen learning for forward movement. And if we're looking at the IFC definition, which is the International Federation of Coaching, it's this long thing. I'll share these, these slides with you, um, or you can take a little snapshot or screenshot or whatever. But the, the powerful, actually, nope, I want someone else. Someone come off mute and read the top part of this definition for me. I can do it, Emily. Lakshmi, thank you. 
Yeah. Through the process of coaching, clients deepen their learning, improve their performance, and enhance their quality of life. In each meeting, the client chooses the focus of conversation while the coach listens and contributes observations and questions. Awesome. Thank you. So you can see in how it's worded, it's a little different than maybe typical one-on-ones that you'll have with a supervisee. Maybe not, right? Depending on what your role is, depending on maybe it's friends that you're wanting to, but you can have intentional conversations that center and focus and be like, hey, Ethan, I know I, I've been hearing you talking about um, you know, the position that you want to apply for uh, next for a long time. Like let's have let's let's have some conversations about how you know we can really do that. So it's also putting some intention and being very open and forward about it. There might be times where Caitlin and I are talking together and it's like, woof, we just got to get some stuff done, right? That might not be the time or place for coaching conversations, but how can and how might we incorporate questions for that forward movement, right? So when it's important to look at what coaching is, it's also important to look at what it's not. So when we think about mentoring, that's really this dumping of life experience. It's, there's a power experience here that you typically in mentorship identified or unidentified roles, someone is, is seeking to like glean information from. Similar to a consultant, there's still a power dynamic here where there's an expertise that exists where you share that expertise, right? So someone might um, invite a, a consultant to come into a nonprofit to assess um, their accounting structures or assess their organizational culture, whatever that is. There's a sharing of experience. A counselor, this is where things can get tough. And I would also argue for my student affairs folks in the room, we get messy here, right? Sometimes we learn counseling skills, like I'm sharing coaching skills, but then almost take on too much of that counseling because counseling processes past maybe current trauma without these boundaries of, let me work you towards getting the support that you need because I know that I can't hold this for you. But sometimes, right? education, medics, medical, nonprofits, those are helping professions, right? Social work, um, all of those are, are helping. And so we want to help as much as we can, but it's knowing and being aware of our own boundaries. And coaches are very aware of their boundaries. So coaches, again, focus on asking questions for growth. And you're like, all right, there's this table in front of me. I don't see, I don't see supervision anywhere on this, on this role, Emily. Like, like, where does that come in? We're going to talk about that. Again, when we're looking at the crux, right, we have powerful questions to deepen learning for forward movement. It focuses on the future possibilities, not past mistakes, not past whys, maybe stories inform why something has happened, but the focus is really on, okay, how can we assess what happened? Maybe like a start, stop, start, stop, continue. How can we reflect and ask questions about what happened to focus on the future possibilities? in a team, in a working relationship, in whatever experience you have, maybe it's with your family. I'm not gonna go too outside the bounds of what I'm gonna talk about today, but I know that um, with my partner, sometimes she'll be like, don't try to coach me in this. <laughs> and asking questions um, about it can really seek to help understand people's perspectives and work towards forward movement together. So, Again, when you looked at, when you looked at some of the, what am I trying to say? The graph that we just saw, what is a key component that supervising has that coaching does not? Um, can I say? Fran. Yeah, so I, I would say supervising pretty much is very instructive. And this is like very procedural. This is how we do it. This is how we need to do it. And there could be legal implications if things aren't followed. Absolutely. There can be implications if things aren't followed. Th Fran, thank you so much because that gets to it, right? There is an aspect of power within that supervisory. 
like what Fran was saying, it can be instructional. It can be, this is what needs to be done. I'm going to show you how to do it. And then you do it. So there's a part of supervision that absolutely is that. And I will share and tell you that as the generations shift and change, when we look at, I have a graph that um, maybe I'll put into the resources notes. Um, but as we look at different generations, when we look at millennials, Gen Z, the upcoming Gen Alpha, their expectations of managers, supervisors, and, and leaders are way beyond what we have expected in the past. That it has been this direct information comes top down. There is very little decision-making ability between and the generations that we're seeing when they are uh, studied and researched across those expectations are around, you can tell me what to do, I also want you to be involved in me and my growth as a person. And so coaching skills will help uh, benefit this um, in multiple relationships that you have. So Fran, thank you. I do wanna put this out because along with our social identities, our backgrounds and experiences, um, our positionality within the work and hierarchy, all of these have power aspects, whether they be social power or positional power and the positional power comes in this supervisory relationship. And so how I ask a question may have a different implication if I'm a coach who doesn't have any skin in the game than if I'm a supervisor. So if I'm like, hey, Fran, what do you want your next step to be? If I'm a coach and I don't have skin in the game, I don't know what that means. I feel like it's some kind of like sports reference that I'm not actually sure where it comes from. If, if someone does know, you can put it in the chat, that'd be great. Um, but that's a non-threatening question to Fran, right? If I just come, if I'm supervising Fran and I'm like, hey, Fran, what are your next steps and goals? That can be like, ooh, it might feel like they're committed to my development and want to help me. They could also be like, are they trying to get me out? What's going on, right? So there, there are some, there's some emotional intelligence, which we can do a whole nother workshop on. Some emotional intelligence that goes into how and what um questions are asked and checking in about the impact or the intention with it right friend i want to have a conversation with you to ensure that you are getting the most out of this position and i know that the position is only this much of the capacity that you have within you so let's talk about some of the ways and i'm going to ask some questions to get you even further in this role or ready for the next one right that feels very different because of that aspect of power have i lost anyone Am I talking too fast? Give me some feedback. Thank you to whoever put the skin in the game. Oh, thanks, Cammie. You know, I figured it might it might be you who offered that up. All right, any questions so far? Channeling Pamela being more okay with silence as I'm not okay with silence. Ah, Lakshmi, thank you. Okay, so how does coaching relate to supervision and management? Based on what we have learned in the past 20 minutes and some of the conversations we've had, I want to hear in the chat what you think coaching has to do with supervision and management. Spell it out for us. I'll give you about 30 seconds. also want to answer the question of when might you use coaching in supervision? You can also answer that question. <laughs> so seeing some learning and growth focus relating to supervision, um, the good supervisor coaches and mentors continuously, <laughs> always, especially when supervising students being growth focused in addition to task focused. Yes, a responsibility that's different. We use it in our office with undergraduate students, helping them link their experience with them to get jobs and internships clutch. Um, coaching is akin to teachable moments that they can happen at any time. Ooh, and being ready to process those, right? And not only process in the moment, but how they will inform your future. That's great. Thank you to everyone who uh, contributed in the chat. 
So when I was thinking about what I'd been learning in my training from the books that I was reading, the articles, et cetera, I saw coaching in management and supervision come up in the following ways. And these are just some of them. So I want you to also continue to put in the chat ways that they, other ways that they could. Um, successfully attaining goals and steps to get there while being reasonable. I love that because goal setting is reasonable. We're going to talk about that in the grow model, which is a skill that I will leave you with. So in the beginning of the year, we are coming upon, right? We're going into July. I hope if folks are able to take some time that they are able to take that time because we know that there's going to be a whirlwind of the next year coming into us. So how do we set intention now around visions or goals as a team in ways that we might not have before. I feel like the pandemic has created this opportunity to really be thoughtful, and I'm not alone in this, this was not my original thought, right? That the it has created this pause to say, what do we want next year to be like? And how does that align with the needs that we need to be um, attaching to our work, right? So asking those questions, how do you, Caitlin want to be involved in um, the vision for the next year. Sarah, where do you feel like the Career Center would benefit from going um, and how should we get there and what contribution can you make to that, right? What roles do you wanna keep and what roles could we shift? But that takes time and intention, right? Next is working through an issue. Maybe you're stuck, right? Maybe you're at um, the student case management and there is a processing issue and you just cannot figure out how to work through. When you get a team together and you ask some of these questions and, and trust that within the group, you can find the answer and really invite people's voices, it does create that long-term and that buy-in to work through. But less and less people are expecting leaders to have the answers. People are expecting that inspiration for forward movement and team building together right? It's that sharing of power. That's the post-industrial leadership models. Again, I can talk about later. I don't like dropping things and then just like skirting over them. So I apologize when I do that. Um, you can always follow up with me in the chat about like, is there an article that you have around that? And I would love to share them. Work plans. So whether your work plans be, a, again, a team work plan or seeing how individual work plans work with each other. So it could I'm trying to realign my thing. You know, it could possibly be that, um, you know, Akankia and Jill are going to work together to identify work plans through this questioning of, well, where do you want to go? And these are some of the needs that are, are happening. How do you see your skills in alignment with that? And how can we prepare you for the next thing, right? Um, so work plans, individual and team. Evaluations. Right, so starting off evaluations tends to be a lot of this, I have feedback for you, this is how I see you did your work, and then it's over, right? As opposed to maybe Joe is working with one of his staff members and saying, how do you feel like the year went for you? Oh, that aligns with how it did for us, right? Some of this is around facilitation, but it's again, that centering of questions. So working with evaluations and saying, um, you know, and really hearing the answers, right? Really hearing and listening to the content that's there. Um, Check-in meetings, right? Some of them are gonna be like, ooh, we had a to-do list, but sometimes they're gonna be halfway through the semester and being like, you know, maybe Pedro is working with his staff and is like, October is tough. We have a lot of programming and pride. Um, and we have a lot going on. I wanna, you know, we haven't had a conversation in a while. How are, how are things going? Are there resources that we can connect you to, et cetera, right? When there are employee issues, maybe conflict between coming in as um, not the, the try point of a triangle and being the, they said, they said situation, but really coming together and asking questions about what's going on to suss out. Um, we know that management and supervision, when done well, people managing is sometimes upwards of 80% of work that supervisors and managers can do. It's a lot. And so how does this uh, make an easier job for you where they come to their own conclusions and work through it? And then finally, I said multiple 
multiple relationships, right? Maybe it's with your supervisor, right? I'm just gonna, you know, make some implicit explicit. I love my, my supervisor, Pamela. And since I've been able to have this coaching conversation, there have been lots of ways where we have shared statements and she, I see you, <laughs> that we have, right? And being able to ask questions and really hear the answers helps me understand maybe that underlying of what's not being said, or maybe it's that, well, you know, checking in on some of that and being like, how do we get there together, right? Because I believe that, that as we work together in a collaborative role, my work for and with my supervisor is to further the goals and make all of our jobs easier, right? That's, that's the hope. And so how can we do that? And using some of these in relationships that are on that hierarchy, because right, realistically, we are in a hierarchy. How can they go multiple, multiple ways? <laughs> Hey, Em, you had a question from Fran in the chat around tips on getting the idea across that an evaluation is a conversation with the student employee. Thank you. Fran, that's a great, um, a great ask. Let me go back to here. So tips on getting the idea across that an evaluation is a conversation with an, a student employee. That's great. I believe in setting expectations early, and that is from the time of onboarding. Okay, so when we start this process early, so Rachel, you and I work together, right? So I'm just going to use our relationship, right? When Rachel and I, we are actually onboarded at the same time. And so a lot of that first time period, those first weeks and months were about having conversations or about setting expectations with each other, checking in. And so as someone who supervises Rachel, I shared that, you know, the evaluation is a time where feedback can be can be shared and I want that to be a conversation and I wanna invite feedback from you also because there are a variety of reasons why things might not be going the way that they should be. And some of them might have to do with process or might have to do with barriers that exist that you won't know unless it's a conversation, right? Um, and so setting that up early in the onboarding process, either in a verbal expectation or in an email to say, I will be asking questions of you and these are the questions that you can start to think about before we have this conversation. Does that make sense? So it is really important to, again, acknowledge that uh, power uh, relationship that can exist and whether it is felt, um, it's always gonna be felt, but how it's navigated and negotiated really matters. Um, does that kind of, kind of help some of that? Because you can do so much and creating kind of a, an environment of trust where they can be honest with you, that that takes time for sure. I feel like I was all over the place with that answer. Any nuggets in there that you got, Fran? Hopefully so. Oh, good, okay, I can see you now. All right. So we've talked a little bit about this. Um, I do wanna move on for the time because I have a clip that I really want you all to see, but you all are, have already hit on it in the chat before of why and how when working specifically with students, right? But maybe graduate students, maybe folks who are, we all have an employee education privilege. Um, I believe that if we are AP, ooh, I wanna, I wanna rewind on that because I don't wanna say something that's untrue. I'm not quite sure about the expectations for non-student hourlies or hourly employees. And there might be a variety of ways. We know we are in an educational setting, right? We know education is happening all around us, whether they be or in the experiences that we're having. Um, but the education can really be grounded when you have meaning-making conversations, um, asking those questions, connecting to, how do you think that went? How might it be able to be better? What do you think went well on that last shift? I know there have been some uh, tension spots with some colleagues. Uh, how are you working through that? Or what do you feel like is your contribution in that? So having these conversations around it, um, feels like a really great opportunity to keep centering education, even in the experiences that we're having. And that's hard when things are going fast, right? Bookstore rush. I can imagine that that is, that's a tough time to write, sit down and have these like developmental conversations. So I don't want to put an expectation out there that all of, all of the conversations need to be like this. 
but there can in our times um, when the asking questions and listening deep listening deeply really matters. Your role, oop, no, that was in a previous one. Okay. So focusing on these two primary skills, someone put in the chat, what are the two primary skills? If you were to, this is your mid midpoint check-in. If you were to guess, oh, okay, I like it. If we go back to, yep, yes, 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 yes. Listening and asking questions, which hopefully then leads to inspiring, engaging, et cetera, right? So when we're talking about listening, this is not only listening to others. This is also listening to yourself, right? Knowing your strengths and weaknesses, knowing what hope you have for the outcome of a conversation, considering and reflecting on where you are and what your limitations and strengths might be to prepare for the mindset of going into a conversation with someone right and then listening to those employees that you're working with being present i know i can have a phone right here i have my dings going off here i can do this and we know we know that one of the strongest retention tools that we have is a sense of belonging is feeling connected in to at least one person in the institution and I would say that that goes probably for professional staff members in roles, as well as students who, when we assess their persist persistence in the university, right? So if I just come hard at one of my students and I'm like, you know, you haven't been showing up on time and I'm really concerned about the quality of work that you've been doing. And, you know, things are really, really tough right now. Like, you know, this puts a lot of stress on me. Ooh, that's some tough feedback coming quick. And that might center where I am. But did I listen to myself about, okay, what am I really frustrated? And am I prepping myself to listen and to ask questions of this person, right? So, hey, I've, I've noticed you haven't been on time for some shifts and I'm just wondering what's going on. Will you share that with me? They might be dealing with a variety of things that resource-wise you can help them with, right? Or maybe you don't have the skills to help them with, but can connect them beyond, right? That listening through questioning will encourage and increase buy-in support inclusion and a sense of belonging um when that listening is there right because people can tell right if a conky and i are having a conversation and i'm like off in la la land and i'm like you know checking my watch and you know there are a variety of non-verbal skills um or nonverbal cues that will show folks um, that I am or am not. Now there are cultural aspects to that, right? That that's a caveat um, that you can come to the Shape Workshop on intercultural communication. <laughs> but there's there are definite ways that you can encourage um, that listening and um, of self. So by coaching yourself, you can also set yourself up to coach others, right? And we're, we have a specific tool that I'm gonna leave you with that helps you get on the right path uh, to helping yourself coach. Here it is. Okay, so I think, <laughs> thanks. I think that there are um, <laughs> lots of different resources out there. I, I believe that YouTube is just a great place if it's by credible, and, and who just defines credible, right? But there's a lot of resources out there, but searching and digging for the right one really can um, kind of support a topic. Um, and I found this one to be really helpful in terms of breaking down um, and encouraging why coaching for manage, managers can be so powerful. With over 10,000 bits of data, a decade long ability has a possibility of impacting eight 
more lives. Here are the three areas where we need to make managers better coaches. First, help them with their understanding of human beings. Managers tend to study management principles, strategies, and forget the point of being a manager, which is to lead people. Management is a title that is given to a leader of a division or a business. Leaders lead. Leaders lead human beings. The understanding a manager really needs to build is how human beings work. How do they operate? What makes them tick? What gets them frustrated? What gets them jump out of the bed every morning? Understanding human beings is the greatest skill a manager can have. This skill is what they need to develop to coach their teams to deliver an optimal performance. Now, understanding what we do and why we do certain things is not as simple as the Kardashians make it sound. I think you should experience it. You always say I want to experience things, but I don't think you actually want to experience things because you would experience it if you wanted to experience things. I don't know what you're talking about. It's more complicated than that. Here is something that helped me a ton while I coach my teams in my business. Align with your team members' goals. This simple trick is often forgotten. Most managers inspire and motivate the teams for the vision of the company or their own vision. Nothing wrong with that. Having a vision and riling up your troops for it is a great idea. A better idea is to follow up by asking what are the goals of your team members? And then aligning the company goals to their personal goals. When your team sees how they win when the company wins, you have a team that is inspired and motivated to get to the common goal. Second key area to train and coach managers is language. We are so conditioned to say the things that we say in the way we say it that we often don't see how sometimes what we say can hurt people. There was a time as a leader I would crack insensitive jokes. It was from my past conditioning. I wasn't trying to hurt somebody but as I would learn later in life I was hurting people that I loved the most. Language can define the type of leader you are. Here's a little hack that you can share with the managers you are coaching that will shift the way they use language. Shift from enforcing an opinion to asking for one. James Beard, award-winning chef, Grant Akat, learned a lesson in leadership when he lost his taste buds to cancer. Think about a chef who couldn't taste his own food. The lesson he learned made Alenia one of the top restaurants in the entire country. Grant would draw pictures of possible food items. He would share ideas of what he envisioned the food at Alenia may look like. And his team was the one that finally brought it to life. I realized that to make a world-class restaurant, you can't do it yourself. You have to take the voice of all these people. Asking his team questions like, how can we float food, allowed his team to come up with the famous Alenia's balloon dessert. If the managers shift their dialogue from, here is the answer, to what do you think could be the answer, the teams would shine. The managers would shine because they are leading from curiosity and interest towards their team members. The third area of coaching skills that managers need is to be able to resolve conflict. Firstly, conflict is not necessarily bad. Conflicts happen on a daily basis and most of them are so small that you don't need to pay any attention to it. But sometimes conflicts, if left unresolved, can lead to discontent, unhappiness and can even impact the revenue of the company. It's not conflict that is the challenge. It's unresolved conflict that is the challenge. That distinction alone should help managers understand 
which conflicts to engage in and which ones not to engage in. Now, how do you resolve a conflict? Well, one way is how Michael from The Office does it. I don't understand why you keep picking on me. Another way to deal with conflict is to understand where does it arise from and how do you resolve it when it's there. Most conflict arise from lack of appreciation or lack of autonomy. When managers fail to acknowledge team members or other team members fail to recognize efforts of other team members, tensions can arise. When these tensions are left unresolved, they can lead to conflict. Same happens when a manager tries to manage a little too much. It takes away from the freedom of your team members and as the freedom goes away, we tend to build resentment because we feel like we can't really use our capabilities. A not so easy but kind of easy way to resolve that is to have honest conversations. The way you show up, other team members of your team would show up the same way. If you are honest about appreciating your team members, if you are amicable and honest about your feedback to other team members, your team members would reciprocate the same. Getting managers to become better coaches is one of the greatest values that you can add to companies that you serve. When managers do better, companies tend to make greater revenue, the team members are happier, and the workplace is a joyous place to be. This one capability can help managers make workplace a happier place, which can lead to the world being a happier place. Let's make our contribution and make managers better coaches. If you found this video useful, click on the subscribe button, share it with a friend. Right. We'll link to that video if you want to watch it later um, in the resources that we'll send out. Um, but right now, Rachel, we're going to do that thing I talked about um, with that uh, really fun opportunity that everyone loves so much. And arguably, I've heard that people get the most from it because you're stopping hearing me talking and, and thinking you of what is landing with you all. So we're going to do a pair and share. And um, I want you to practice asking questions and listening to the answers, right? So based on what you've learned here, think about what questions you might ask each other. So it might be if Amy and I are connected in a room, I might be like, Amy, what stood out most for you from the session so far? Or Justin, how do you see this showing up um, in the work that you're doing? Or John or Monica or Michelle, right? So, so thinking about, um, uh, you know, Ethan, talk to me about the team that you're on and how you see this already happening. Um, what are questions you can ask of each other? I'm not going to dictate them for you, but thinking about where we've been so far in these 45 minutes, I'm going to give you five minutes to have a conversation um, with pairs. So Rachel, if we could set those for five minutes um, with a one minute comeback, that would be great. Let me know if you have questions. We'll see you in a few. Rachel, let's pop Kaylee in with Jesse. Are you going to? Oh, Brian came. I'm continuously scanning to make sure. I think Kaylee could Kaylee. go into room three with Lakshmi and Nancy. Yeah. Oh, Justin went. Oh, okay. oh, there we go. Okay. I think we're good. Okay, we will. I had to do some quick moving around. I had it set up earlier and then it did something funky and put a bunch of people in single rooms. I don't know if we, I didn't think we lost anyone though. So I'm not sure. Start the recording. 
Awesome. And then we will, because I really want to make sure that we have the time to go through a couple of these resources that I have for you. So hopefully uh, you centered questions and you centered listening and you learned a little bit about teams or environments um, of some of the folks that you were with in your in your room. We also want to acknowledge that, you know, asking questions and listening to the answers, it can take trust that may or may not be built in the conversations that you just had. And the depth and level of the questions can stay at the level of trust that the relationship has, right? And one of the ways to build trust is to have conversations that center the other person and to really hear and listen to their perspective and relate in, et cetera. So I just wanted to say that also to not assume that, you know, you had a world transforming conversation in five minutes and i don't want to have the expectation that some of you didn't so here are going to be three tools that you can take with you as you go one is the video but that's not actually on here so <laughs> we'll still give you that uh, link to the video but the first one is going to be called the grow model so it takes um our smart goals so some of you know about smart goals making sure the goals that you have are um, specific measurable attainable realistic and time sensitive or something like that there are a couple that shift for folks but it takes that and it, it builds it out a little bit more the choice map which is going to be that tool where you can coach yourself and then the list questions. So these are going to be the three tools that we're going to go through. I want to take a note that the tools and coaching in whole are to be considered through the awareness of your own biases and creating trust and support of your employees. This is key, right? So there are some people that I know just hook me differently than some other people, right? So I have to mentally prepare and that's, that's my work, right? That's not necessarily on the other person. But when I am more aware, and I hope that you will come to the next workshop on bias in hiring, recruitment, and retention, um, or go to our feedback workshop tomorrow, but really understanding your own biases, past experiences, or how you can build trust, that's really within the caveat of all of these tools. So the first one is that GROW model. So I would say, well, it was told to me in my, in my training class that like 96% of coaches know and utilize the GROW model. Is that accurate and true? I'm not quite sure. Um, I didn't ask them for their resources, which I should have. But the GROW model, again, takes those goals and then asks how. It goes to that to that difference. It's not just about putting it on a piece of paper or marking it up, but it's asking about the reality. You know, what support do you need? What challenges do you foresee rising and coming up? So it's, it's allowing to say, this is going to be really tough and this is what I see and being able to talk through. The O stands for options. So what are the pros and cons of each option? Um, what factors can you consider? Um, and then will or your way forward. And I think this is a key and clutch one. As you are hoping to work with your folks to inspire and encourage them um, and have them feel bought into the project. So I'm thinking about, you know, the questions are like, what would you need to happen to make this commitment? And what are you willing to do? So what is your contribution? What are you willing to identify, give up maybe, um, to, to move forward the goals that you want to see. So maybe, you know, in Nancy's area um, in environmental services, it's um, a student who is, it's a grad student and is like, you know, I have a goal that I want to make the efficiency better of how we move through the Lori Student Center. And it's like, okay, first is, you know, Nancy's goal to be like, am I open to this feedback? I feel like this is okay, let's build this together. They're bought in. How do they want to see that, right? Well, what is the reality? What challenges? Well, communicating it out might be hard. Um, what are the options that we have? What will? I'm an engineering student and I want to align the things that I'm using and learning with what we're doing. And that's going to get folks bought in differently than just a job to do, right? I don't know, Nancy, if that <laughs> example rings true. I came up a little bit with it on the fly. But I think about, you know, um, where that can be. Ooh, Rachel, thank you for popping that in. So if you can stay and hang out, please do for a couple more minutes. Um, 
and fill out the uh, attendance form for us. That would be great. The um, second one, which could have a whole on uh, a whole session on itself, is called the choice map, and this is your self coaching, right? So this is the opportunity um, to ask yourself if you want to take a learner's mindset or a judger's mindset and how you're going to approach. And when you start ask, when you track or pay attention that you're asking yourself these questions, how can you shift away, right? How can you switch over to that line, lane, right? And it has a variety of questions that you can ask yourself. So that is in the chat now as well. And then if you want to use the GROW model, there is a list of 70 questions um, that managers can use. Because sometimes, you know, for me, I'm like, I don't ask very good questions because I don't feel like I have a lot accessible to me. And then I learned that there are all these lists out there of really great questions. Again, um, being culturally um, uh, tactful within the questions and how they might land having to do with power in your relationship. Um, but having those list of questions, they're all hyperlinked so you can go back to them. So as you are about to leave, and I'd love for folks before you leave to come off mute and say goodbye, but I want you to identify one or two aspects from this workshop that you could implement tomorrow, whether it be in a supervisory role or a partnership or your parents or caretakers, what could you implement tomorrow based on that? Um, this is a reminder of where we've been, having discussed coaching, where and how to use it in supervision, focused on those two primary skills of listening and asking questions, and then overviewed some tools to take to take with you. There are the resources, and I'm going to say thanks to you all. Um, Fran, there is a dinosaur. What's the come off mute? What does that mean? Um, I'm getting lots of feedback. Sound like a dinosaur shrieking. Now I got, I'm hearing, I'm hearing some sort of thing. So I oh. think I was like putting things in the, the. I know what I did. Never mind. Okay. If other people were hearing dinosaurs, let me know. Um, but hopefully, uh, some of you will take some skills. Would love to see them in the chat. And as you're leaving, come off mute and say goodbye. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Ah, oh, awesome. Awesome. Bye. Martha, thanks for being here. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Ethan. Great to see you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Emily. Bye, Kanya. Bye, Kaylee. Thanks. Bye, Lakshmi. Bye, Bye Caitlin. <laughs> Bye. Bye, Cammy. Yeah, Fran, thank you.